Madam Mayor, members of the council, we have nearly um, exceeded the halfway point of the uh, General Assembly's regular session. So tonight we thought it would be appropriate to bring um, representatives from our two lobbying firms to provide an update to the council, uh, really framing where the session's at and what uh, we foresee happening in the second half. Uh, without further ado, we will ask Chris Ropey from uh, John Barger and Associates to come up and uh, give you an update. And Chris will be followed by Tom Robbins from Strategic Capital. Fine by me. I'm, I'm getting a message that people are not hearing you. Can you speak into the microphone, please? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd make sure it's on. Can you hear me? No. I can talk louder. <laughs> <laughs> it it, well, it's, it's going online and people okay. can't see it. That's the problem. So. Um, talk louder. <laughs> she tried. The mic's not working. <laughs> you want me to wait? Yeah, we're going. Well, how'd you get pregnant? <laughs> um, still alive, <laughs> but barely. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. We can maybe press that a little. Is that my mic? Kind of itchy. That's your mic. <laughs> Is that better? Oh. That's it. <laughs> Okay, there, that's, there we go, that's better. Um, so as I was saying, part of, of the governor's effort to reorganize state government is um, an additional thing is taking the division of energy and moving that over to uh, the Department of Natural, Natural Resources. He's doing that by an executive order. And then he's taking the Public Service Commission and the Office of Public Counsel, which, which regulate our investor-owned utilities, and he's moving those over to the Department of Insurance. And then a, a small change, but I know important to this community, the Arts Council, he is moving that under the Lieutenant Governor's Office and the job duties that, that come with that constitutional statewide office. Um, the, other, the other big agenda items that you'll see from the Republican-controlled legislature that they're going to try to get across the finish line in the remaining eight weeks um, there's some tort reform issues they want to get done on, on making some changes to our judicial and litigation um, system that we have in our state. 
Um, there will be some pro-life legislation that gets a lot of attention um, that deals with a, it's called the heartbeat bill, um, to make some changes to, to enhance that for, for Republicans in Jeff City. Education reform is another big priority you're going to see a lot of time get spent on. Um, you probably have seen in the news some changes in higher education regarding the Title IX um, process for sexual assaults that take place on our higher education campuses. Um, there's an effort to reform that that will uh, receive a lot of attention as we move down um, towards the end of session. Bridge funding, which I'll talk about that here specifically to independence in a second. Um, you've got competing, um, competing ways to do that. The House has an idea of how they want to do it, and the Senate and the, and the governor have a way that they'd like to do it. Mayor, go ahead. Oh, I thought you had a question. I'm sorry. Um, and then there'll be some reforms that will be attempted to made, uh, be made to Medicaid um, to go to some, uh, what I would call some, some required work um, up to 80 hours a week to be eligible for, for Medicaid moving forward in our state. Prescription drug monitoring program. We currently are, I think, the last state remaining to not have that on a statewide basis. Um, they are working on that as well. And then the final big issue, um, which I know is of interest to you all as well, is the low-income housing tax credit um, program. Getting that back up and running um, is going to come along with some significant changes to the program legislatively in order uh, to do that. So you'll see, you'll see those things get talked about as far as priorities from uh, House and Senate leadership and the governor as we, we go down the home stretch here. Um, a few issues specific to independence that we've been working on your behalf. Um, with Senator Rizzo, uh, trying to get some funding for the Truman Library. He's working on $2 million this year, um, and then I think $2 million um, next year as well. And he will, um, you know, he's working with the Appropriations Chairman in the Senate, and once the budget bills come over, he will uh, continue to try to make that happen in, in the Appropriation Committee work as it moves through the Senate. And then another bill that he's, he's being very helpful on is the abandoned property cleanup um, legislation, as I call it, where you can have immunity for, for people who want to go into these properties and clean them up for the betterment of the neighborhood, for the city, you know, whatever the case may be, but we need to get independence added to that legislation, and we will attempt to do that on the Senate floor. Um, if you look at some, some items of where we're at with the budget, we are at about a 5% um, decrease right now from where we were last year at this time. And then in order for the governor to not withhold and for the rest of this fiscal year and then for the legislature um, itself to not have restrict um, spending restrictions for next year, we have got to close out the, the end of this fiscal year at about 1.7% growth. Um, you've seen some things in the press about the Department of Revenue and how some of the withholdings tables were miscalculated and everyone's pointing fingers at each other. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think it'll come out closer to where it, it needs to be, but I know a lot of people are pretty nervous about the cuts that could take place if we don't get there um, with the amount of revenue that we, we bring into the state. Um, regional Crime Lab, I know a very important topic that you all are working on. Um, we had several meetings with the governor's um, senior policy advisors, uh, met with them again, I think two weeks ago, to just remind them that it is something of interest if, if it is where um, they would like to see this solution um, take place that we would love to be a part of that. Um, I think in, in the governor's budget, just to give you some specifics of um, while he is not, I think, ready to do that and the expenditures that would come with that at this time, what he has done to try to address that issue is recommended here. Um, nine new FTEs to work on the backlog that has occurred with our DNA testing and, and rape kits to try to figure out and further um, take care of those problems that we're seeing across the state. Um, the House and the governor himself, that was what his department recommended, Department of Public Safety. Um, I think the, you'll see come out of the House committee will be five new FTEs and about $300,000 in new funding to cover that. Um, and then the toxicology equipment, there's several new pieces of equipment that they have tried to put in the budget that the, um, the House and the governor recommended and the House upheld that you'll see come out of there of about $300,000 to address um, that issue. And then in order, I know at, at the state crime lab, they are losing a lot of, of criminologists to other departments or, or federal agencies, and they aren't able to keep that, um, that workforce there. So they've, they've tried to increase some funding for that as well to, to not have so much turnover and to keep their really good people on so they can process these cases in an efficient manner. Um, so they, the, the department requested some money there that I think the Senate will work on um, to try to make sure that it's about $300,000 to cover those, to keep, keep those employees, um, stay put where they are 
um, currently. Municipal court reform, your ability to suspend driver's license, one of our favorite subjects that um, there are several senators who just over on the St. Louis side of the state who don't see eye to eye with us on that issue and it's been challenging to get them um, to get on board with the, uh, the ability for us to protect the public and for you to do your jobs and your, and your different departments here to do their jobs to protect the public. Um, I've had some good conversations. Um, John Barger and I have, have talked with some of the, the main opponents to that in the past and I think they are willing to work on that issue this year. Um, there's, there's a piece of legislation sponsored by Senator Emery who has several municipalities in his district that are very interested in this issue. Um, so he's pushing very hard. We've got a bill out of, out of committee in the Senate um, to address that. And what that process, it's, it's not perfect. Um, and I think you'll see some changes will still come along with what he's going to propose in his bill. But he sets up essentially an administrative tribunal where any of your uh, failure to appears and your, your ordinance violations, minor traffic violations will get kicked over to that system so it clears off of your municipal court docket and then they are allowed to assess points essentially if they don't show up to that tribunal administrative court um, and they can enact the same uh, penalties as you can do in your municipal court. You just do it in that, that aspect. Um, and I know there's some headache and some costs, but that seemed to be several cities were interested in that doing it that way if it, it allowed them to address this issue. I think you'll see changes made to that as we go forward on the Senate floor. We'll keep you posted and see where that goes. We just need to have the debate because I think we can um, get to a place where people are comfortable doing something to solve this without increasing fines. That's the big fear of what the folks in the St. Louis area don't want to do. Um, but we're going to have a good debate on that and see where that goes. There's a, a similar bill in the House that does it in a more traditional way, which just allows um, cities to um, be able to assess points to the, or let Department of Revenue assess points for failure to appear, um, which would resolve your issue as well. That's been voted out of House Committee, um, and I think you'll see that put on the, the House calendar here pretty quickly to get debated by the full House and um, try to move forward. Another issue of high importance to, um, to a lot of the bigger cities around the state of Missouri um, is dealing with the use tax on Internet sales, and that's what they're calling is a use tax of, of how to collect that money. Um, Senator Sandy Crawford has a piece of legislation that seems to ideally be the vehicle to do that. And just kind of how that works um, is it creates a what they call an economic nexus, which is a threshold of $100,000. If, if you do that much in sales, you have to participate. You have to collect those taxes and submit them to the state of Missouri. And then it has what's called a facilitator um, collection as well, which is like an Amazon type. They would have to then... Um, to help their smaller sellers out. They're the ones responsible for collecting and submitting that to the state of Missouri. So I know that's, that's something that's, that's very important on a lot of people's minds around the state, specifically here, um, that I think you'll see a lot of attention and a lot of debate about as it, as it moves forward. Um, there's a bill on the, the Senate calendar that has been debated that deals with some corporate tax cuts that this language has been added to as sort of sweetener to get some people to go along with that idea of further cutting corporate taxes. Um, I don't know if they will get that done or not or how that will all shake out at the end of the day, but we are um, keeping an eye on it. And if it's, if it's going to pass, we want to be a part of it with solving this use tax um, issue um, for, for you all here locally. Bridge funding. Like I mentioned, the, the House has an idea of how they want to do it. The Senate and the governor have an idea of how they would like to do it. The House's, uh, excuse me, I'll start with the Senate. The Senate's proposal um, Senator Schatz, who is the president pro tem of the Senate, he, that's the, the number one ranking, ranking leadership um, position in the Senate, is carrying the bill. So that's a good sign to show how important it is. It would address 250 bridges around the state. It would, um, they would spend $351 million and they would pay that off with, with bonds at $30 million a year. Um, Several of those bridges are here in Independence and several are in the Kansas City area and surrounding areas. The three that stuck out to me were the uh, Delaware Avenue and Truman Library Drive bridge, which would be about $2.1 million that would be coming into the community to fix. Um, the Highway 24 bridge just right by Buckner, I'm not 100% sure how, how close that is, but that's about a $7.6 million investment um, that would go there to fix four bridges and then um, Blue Ridge and 40 is a $5.2 million bridge there that would get fixed if this proposal would, would get passed. The House um, doesn't like that idea. Um, it's too much in interest payments. They want to fund it through general revenue on an annual basis, which I think some of the senators have problems with that because 
they don't they don't feel like that is the proper way to be able to plan and do big projects knowing that the money will or won't be there um, in subsequent years and so they'd like to see them do it um, their way the way the way the resolution is proposed in the Senate and I think there's about 175 million dollars in federal transportation dollars at stake as well if um, we don't do it in a way that the, that the Senate wants to do it and they don't want to miss out on that opportunity the last thing that I want to address is um, some waivers about mental health and Medicaid um, dollars that are eligible for that. There, several states have, have gotten the department, um, the federal department under Trump, to, to allow them to do a waiver um, where you can have more than 16 beds for a mental health um, facility. That we have gone away in the state of Missouri from warehousing as, or from ins institutionalizing mental health patients. And so um, it's, a, it's a way where there's, there's two proposals that they're looking at from the state of Missouri and how we want to address that. One is for severe substance abuse problems. Um, the local community partnerships around the state are very hesitant to invest the infrastructure needed to do that on such a short-term fix. So the department is still trying to figure out if they want to go down that road or not because they don't have that local buy-in to seek that waiver. So they're determining that still. And then the, the waiver for what is called serious and persistent mental disorder that is something that the department is in the process of applying to the to the feds for and it's probably a year away from having a, a decision um, from the feds whether they will allow that waiver in the state of missouri like i said 13 other states have done that and um, so they're going to go down that that process of, of figuring out some mental health needs um, that'll affect a lot of local communities uh, around the state then there's, I think we're tracking about 271 pieces of legislation. I mean, none of them are as major as some of the ones I just listed, but it's, it's the state and, and the policies coming from lawmakers that want to tell you what to do and they want to increase regulations or, or, or do things that make it harder for, for you to run your city. We're keeping an eye on all of those. There's a handful that are probably getting a little bit of traction, but we are working with your local delegation to address those. Um, there's, you can't put out 271 fires as they're moving through the legislature, so the ones that actually look like um, are gonna get serious debate, those are what we focus on on your behalf. So I'll turn it, answer questions or let Tommy address some of the, some of the things they're doing and, and can answer questions at the end or however, however y'all would like to do it. Okay, all right. I, I, Exactly right. This authorizes cities or whatever the, the political jurisdiction might be to the right. ability then to go say this is what we want to do and you'd have to do it locally. That's correct. That is right, yes. Yep, that's exactly right. And I, I think you'll see that legislation. Um, there's several bills that have, have crossed chambers where it would fit as an amendment. And you'll, I mean, there's so much interest in this issue in trying to solve it. It's a priority for the governor, I know, as well. Um, so I think, you know, this will get debated a lot and um, will get put on several other pieces of legislation that are, are coming our way down the stretch here. Thanks. Props. 
uh, evening. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present. Um, I, I, I tracked, I decided that I would use your priorities to track what I tell you. Uh, and the first one would be the city supports local control uh, rights of way and public assets dealing with pole attachments and high speed wireless development. So that last year we were able to work out a bill that we are very proud of that took the cap off the utility poles and then instituted on the light poles $150 cap, which is the second highest in the nation. So we're very proud of that. Uh, not to rest on our laurels, we, we've watched every bill uh, that has come through and they've, they've attempted no incursions, no changes to that bill this year. So uh, the time period has passed, it was March 1st uh, for sponsoring new legislation. So uh, any sort of changes has to be done by amendment and at this point they're running out of time to, to be heard in committee. So all is looking well on that front. Uh, Related to this uh, would be the franchise fee. Cable is losing market share. And so they're trying to find a way to cut their costs. Uh, they decided to file Senate Bill 273, which would gut the franchise fee from 5% to 3%. That would cost independents $540,000, which I was able to find out like that, thanks to Mayor Weir and John. They, uh, and Zach, the, your, your staff is, um, is amazing. And, and uh, of all our clients, nobody is more engaged than them. Uh, so that, that would amount to at just 500,000, seven and a half firefighters, eight police officers, and like 15% of your road overlay. Obviously that would be a problem. So we saw that bill, it, it came up, we gathered a coalition and we, isolated cable so that they were the lone wolf in support and there were so many they were <laughs> everybody else was against it everyone strange bad fellows that's what politics makes right uh, us in the telecoms were up there together so uh, that was nice it's always nice to, uh, to be on the winning side now the session's not over but so far there's been no movement on it since it's it was heard on uh, February 27th so we feel like that's, that's a good sign. Uh, net metering, you wanna keep your local control. No bill has been filed on, on net metering. Uh, decoupling, you, you oppose that, no bill has been filed on that. So those two areas seem to be safe. Um, I wanted to discuss the state water quality loan funding. I saw that in your priorities. If I could learn more about that, then we could find an appropriate sponsor for next year in order to push that. I, just, I don't know enough about it, um, but I, I've been looking at what, what you sent and it looks like something you know that we could certainly push and that we would want to, uh, but it, it would probably need to be next year. Though if staff or somebody could get us some language, we can try to offer it in committee and we'd be happy to do that. So perhaps that, that we could get the conversation started that way this year. Um, so my favorite bill, and Council Member Van Camp's favorite bill, is the film tax credit. Um, let's see, House Bill 923, it authorizes tax credit for qualified film projects and caps the program at four and a half million. It, it, it expired in 2013, and you'll see uh, countless uh, programs being filmed, set in Missouri, filmed in Georgia. Why? Because Georgia has the best uh, tax credit program. So Councilman Van Camp came in and testified, and may, may I approach? I don't know, it's just like court. It's just like court. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Here, I just thought of this. You got a blur there. Wow. Oh, thank you. So, will you read that? What, what is your quote there? That's movies about imagination. 
It was promptly voted out and it was just referred to rules today. So uh, it, it still has has to make its way through the Senate and the Senate is is a is a gauntlet of sorts for anything tax credit, but we're moving in the right direction. Uh, I, that was that was the best attended and most positive hearing I've probably been to this session. So thank you for your help. Thanks for letting us engage on that. I think it would make Missouri a better place. Um, that's that those are the uh, the priorities that I show uh, there's one other that didn't that wasn't on the priorities that I've discussed in the call on our biweekly calls and that's Senate Bill 66 which deals with uh, water safety and security uh, you oppose it and you got us engaged about uh, right before the hearing and it has not moved since so it's it's embargoed at, uh, ever since January 29th when it was heard. So we show no movement on that, but we will track it and we'll track all the bills that are moving to make sure that it doesn't, it isn't added on to any of those. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's, no, oh, it's, I mean, Certainly. Thank you very much. And that's an excellent point. I should have added uh, that this is the first year since I started lobbying that there are no net metering or decoupling bills. So. Um, I, we won't take full credit for it, but it is, it will take a little. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it's easy. I mean, we have our form, but having been down there before, uh, you, it's really, you know, that we haven't done this. We haven't got a crime lab. We haven't got this. We haven't got that. But as the mayor quite precisely pointed out, we've stopped. And those are victories also. You don't always see those victories unless it's brought here. And given the state of affairs, <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> I, you know, new governor, old one it is, new things, wanting to make his mark, want, you know, erasing what had been put in, mm -hmm. I thank you. Yep. very much for your thank endeavors. You. Well, thank you very much. Yes, Madam Mayor, members of the council, about a year ago, the city broke ground on construction of the Uptown Market on the Independence Square. Um, one year later, we've not only completed construction, um, but hosted a number of successful events there and really changed the landscape of of the independent square and the Truman Road corridor in accordance with our strategic plan. So tonight I have asked our director of parks, recreation and tourism, Eric Erfer, uh, to come give the council an update on where we stand. Um, a little less than a year since we began operation there. 
and um, share some of those successes with the council on the on the real community success story for us. Great, thank you, Zach. Uh, <laughs> I know, my gosh, well, it was a little crowded up here before, so this is good. <laughs> good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Thank you for the opportunity to come and give an update on the first six months of operations at your new Independence Uptown Market. As you may recall, the city cut the ribbon on the new market facility in late August of 2015, 2018, just in time for our Santa Caligon festivities. Since that time, the market has played host to a number of different events, classes, and private rentals. The, one of the first and foremost, obviously, the, the steadiest programs that we've got going on there is the Independence Farmers Market. Uh, the market was moved from its uh, old location, which was in a parking lot, uh, to this new facility last fall. And since that time, the attendance at the market has gone up and the vendors have reported so too have their sales. In addition to the uh, traditional farmer's market, we also added a winter's market uh, this last year. Uh, that market is open to the public one Saturday a month through the off season. Uh, we received a lot of positive feedback regarding the quality of those of the, the products that are sold and especially uh, the number of types of vendors that we've been putting in that facility. The amount of activities and the family friendly atmosphere for both the traditional winter markets has been very well received and the turnout for the market has been great, uh, but so too has all the uh, participation levels at all the different special events that we've had there so far. To refresh your memory, uh, here are a few of the current, uh, few of the events that the market has hosted through its first six months. Uh, the U.S. Capitol Christmas tree, of course, paid us a little visit. As did a number of our resident pet populations for the family uh, furry and bright holiday photo event, which was very popular. From holiday parties to storytelling, to Zumbathons, pep rallies, and family game nights, the Independence Uptown Market has been a very, very busy place over the last six months. In addition to those events, staff took full advantage of the new square footage that we now have under our umbrella uh, to develop a whole new slate of programs for our community. Among them, the second Sunday Uptown Flea Market uh, has been extremely popular. And the make and take workshops have been extremely popular as well. Uh, almost all of these have sold out, so much so that we've had to extend it into two, sometimes three sessions to accommodate all of those on the waiting lists. Even with all that activity though, there's still been plenty of time for people to rent and reserve the facility for different types of private events, uh, from meetings to social gatherings. Uh, the community certainly has turned out to try to, to hold their space in there as well. The facility has about 360 as far as the seating capacity is concerned. Uh, we do have a catering kitchen, sound system, tables and chairs that are also available for rental. As I said, there are a lot of different graduation parties, wedding events, fundraisers, meetings and seminars that have already taken place there. And much like the feed that feedback that we've received from all of the different patrons attending all the different special events, uh, those that have come to rent the facility have given us high marks, not just on the facility itself, but the staff that they've dealt with uh, in renting their, for their special event. So far, and this is slightly dated, uh, this is about uh, three or four weeks old now, uh, we have had 11 different private rentals, 43 different programs, and we have hosted 32 different special events at the facility all in the past six months. And there's still more to come. This coming up spring and summer, we have Zumba events. Uh, they're back on the queue. Uh, we have more family game nights uh, lined up. We have more make and takes, and we even have another Project Linus uh, in the works as well. Project Linus is a group of volunteers that comes in and they make uh, Afghans uh, for children in need. The last one that came through, uh, they actually did a whole series of uh, Afghans for uh, children that were in the NICU, which is a pretty special program. So we also have some social activities for homeschool kids, classic car shows, a summer concert series lined up, and of course the return of the popular farmer's market. Again, all will be starting here soon. Uh, the market opens this May, and then we'll be taking off from there throughout the summer season. So for more information about any of those different type of events or programs, you can visit the website that's on the bottom of this slide, uh, or for any of the rental information there as well. Uh, so again, thank you for your support uh, so far for this facility. 
It has been one of those difference makers, and we are proud to have it under the Parks, Recreation, and Tourism umbrella. And with that, uh, that concludes the first six months report, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Not so much a um, question, but just more comments. I think we've done an outstanding job, and, and thank you, Eric, for making this a, helping make this a success. I know the, the discussions that we had surrounding the, the, this possibility in the community conversations we've had, I received a lot for and also a lot against, and surprisingly, I've received uh, uh, quite a few calls from people who were against this for whatever reason, saying, you know what, this has changed the landscape, this has looked nicer than what I anticipated, and by God, they're, they're using it, it's cool, it's a nice facility, so I've had an interesting um, um, mix of people calling me saying, you know what, this is actually decent, and knowing independence politics, that doesn't happen a lot, <laughs> so I chalk that up to, to good, good credit on your guys' support for helping us see that vision moving forward. I appreciate that, and I'll pass that on to staff. I don't want to take any credit for any of those different programs that you just saw. We have an amazing team working on this. And I've been working with Becca a lot, though, and I really appreciate all yeah. of her work in, She's in trying fabulous. to help organize and, and doing some different events there for some different organizations who are trying to think out of the box of, well, where can we go and hold something that's different and unique and just fits the bill? So she's been awesome, too. Yes, she has. Thank you. I'll pass it on. Thank, thank you, Eric. Good management, and I don't know how we did without it. <laughs> so, thanks. Thank you. Add to that, this building was uh, uh, not fully funded by the City of Independence. We had the Rotarian, um, the Rotary Club step up and have their fundraiser, and they really um, helped out with this. So. It's been very important. Uh, I, too, have received glowing reports about this and uh, uh, received some doubters, too, before this, but they have been overshadowed by the success um, in just six months. I mean, this mel well may be the second greatest program we've had <laughs> <laughs> anywhere. Any no, uh, congratulations. And, uh, you know, we've talked about several things to be having there. The one of my favorite ping pong things and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Uh, what a success. And it's due to everybody. But thank you. Thank you. We'll pass that on. Thank you. Uh, man. Uh, me and Councilman Huff are going to be representing them at these awards, the city, and uh, I had to skip out on a neighborhood meeting. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I wanted to be there. Thank you.
Yes, Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, last year during our budget development process, um, Chief Halsey presented an interesting challenge to us, and that was to identify new funding to be able to really meet a strong need uh, uh, and desire of this community and, and the city council, and that was to provide adequate staffing for uh, what we were calling a street crimes unit, to really provide officers who would get uh, into the community, into the residential and commercial areas, and begin to tackle issues of crime and disorder. Um, we were able to identify the funding. The council was um, receptive to supporting that budget recommendation, uh, and we've had a tremendous amount of success with that uh, since its inception. So tonight, I've asked uh, Major John Cato to come forward and let the council know uh, the work that the men and women of the Street Crimes Unit have been able to do in just a very short amount of time. So I will yield to Major Cato. Thank you. Madam Mayor and Council, uh, you know, in almost three decades with the police department, there's probably a half dozen times I can think that we've actually done something that's out of the norm, out of the box, or was new for us that has really made a, a very impactful difference community-wide at one time. Uh, I think the implementation of the Street Crimes Unit is one of those examples. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't express uh, my thanks and the thanks to the department to each and every one of you for your support. Uh, the city manager's office, and of course our chief, uh, Chief Halsey. Uh, we've exceeded expectations at this early date. I don't think we, we ever anticipated we'd have the early success of hitting the ground running like we had, or like we have. Um, it's truly a unique example of uh, devoted resources that meets a particular need at a particular time and the, and the rapid success that you can have. Uh, it's my pleasure here shortly to introduce to you uh, Sergeant Justin English of our Street Crimes Unit. Uh, he's going to share with you some, some raw numbers and some statistics and some examples of their good work and their progress. Uh, it speaks uh, loads to them as far as their commitment. Uh, that unit, they're all here tonight uh, on their own time. Either that or they don't want me to talk about them when they're not here. Uh, but I'm, I'm impressed every day uh, by their devotion, their commitment, and the quick process that they've made. So uh, I would remind you, the only thing I would remind is some of these examples that you'll be shared with tonight, specific details aren't evident because they're involving many cases that are clear, that are currently still under adjudication and still in process. So that limits some of the information of specifics that we can share. But uh, without any more delay, I'll introduce to you Sergeant English. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to update everyone with uh, the success that the Street Crimes Unit has had thus far. Um, and I wanna thank you all for your buy-in early on in this, in this process. I think you'll find that uh, it's, it's definitely something that has been beneficial for the city and hopefully will continue to be. So the Street Crimes Unit, uh, <coughs> was. there's been a lot of buildup for the Street Crimes Unit, but it, it takes a lot of logistics to put things in place to get us where we are here today. Uh, so the unit was, was not actually officially formed and there were no personnel allocated until December 11th of 2018. And at that point, there were four detectives and one sergeant. Um, as of January 22nd of 2019, three additional detectives were transferred, give us the full complement of the seven detectives and myself as the field supervisor. So from December 11th, to March 25th of 2019, the Street Crimes has actually worked 60 working days in the field uh, that we have had the opportunity to take enforcement. In those 60 days, uh, and these numbers actually uh, were submitted last week, I, I can add to some of those numbers, um, we've recovered actually 26 firearms that were either stolen or in conjunction with another crime. Many of those were uh, involved in drug trafficking or other violent crime, but all 26 of those firearms are uh, directly related to another uh, felony crime. We have eight firearm enhancements. Those are things like uh, silencers or homemade suppressors that they would put on those weapons to, uh, to help further uh, their crime but make it undetected. We've recovered eight of those. Um, felony warrant arrest. Those are felony warrants that were issued by the court uh, for felony crimes for outstanding persons, and we have arrested 55 people on felony warrants. City warrants, we are well over 250 city warrants that we have arrested thus far. 
We have arrested two people on federal warrants. We have recovered approximately 22 stolen autos. And recovered stolen property, I have an unknown there. That's, that's kind of an interesting case. Um, you would think that we'd be able to track the recovered uh, stolen property um, that we have been a part of. However, we were uh, inserted into a specific case that I will uh, bring up here at the end of the presentation where we actually have recovered several thousand items of stolen property linked to numerous burglaries, uh, things like that. So at this point, we have so much property that we are still counting weeks and weeks and weeks later of the items that we have recovered. Um, we have recovered methamphetamine, heroin, fentanyl, a variety of different prescription controlled pills and a volume of marijuana. We've issued 63 traffic tickets and we have deployed 12 of the GPS ankle or monitoring uh, bracelets that uh, the jail and the courts use for monitoring our most prolific offenders out in the community. <coughs> and probably the number to me that, that is most staggering is the search warrants for structures. Um, we have 25 search warrants served to date for felony crimes. A couple cases, uh, and just to kind of kind of show the pictures, uh, you know, picture says a thousand, a thousand words, kind of let you know on a daily basis what these detectives are out in the field, and really not just these detectives, but the department in general are out there facing. Uh, this was a firearm, a stolen firearm that was recovered during the foot pursuit um, in our city. The suspect uh, discarded the gun during the foot chase, and it was recovered, and he was charged with it later. Um, just a picture of some heroin, some marijuana, some uh, paraphernalia. This case was one of uh, our, I would say, a very prolific offender in the city. It was, it was giving problems to us uh, repeatedly on a weekly basis. A search warrant uh, was obtained and these items were recovered, a considerable amount of currency. That firearm there that actually looks like a toy is actually a firearm. It was stolen, taken in conjunction with a burglary. Um, there was marijuana and some other controlled pills and um, methamphetamine that was recovered. This is over almost 600 uh, controlled prescription pills with a street value between five and $8,000. This case, uh, there was a stolen firearm, some uh, police uniforms that were either purchased or acquired illegally somehow that were in the subject's house. There was body armor, just like the armor that we wear as police officers, and there was a duty belt similar to the ones that we carry, um, as well as controlled substance uh, that was gathered after a search warrant in our city. This is a couple firearms that were taken in conjunction with a drug distribution network. The interesting thing about this is these firearms are, have homemade threading on the end of the barrel so they can attach the suppressors uh, to make the firing the gun um, undetected. Here's a picture of some of those homemade suppressors and that book that they're actually laying on is, is kind of an older version, but a version of a kind of a one, two, three on how to build suppressors to attach them to your firearms. And there's just some more pictures of some firearms and uh, narcotics. I believe both of these cases, they were felon, uh, felon subjects. They were felons in possession of these firearms while uh, involved in the distribution of controlled substance. This is kind of hard to gauge or see uh, how much or how the quantity uh, of this substance, but this is uh, approximately half a pound of a, <coughs> it's a, concoction of several different controlled substance and drugs that, that were fused together. And the most uh, alarming thing to us when this was tested is this contained fentanyl, uh, a high volume of fentanyl. Um, as you probably know from watching the media and everything, that fentanyl is very dangerous for law enforcement. Simply just handling it can cause, uh, can have some very serious ill effects. Um, we did recover this during an investigation and actually this was this caught national attention in the law enforcement community because this specific substance had yet to be reported or identified 
across the country. So I know that uh, during our investigation, we consulted with a federal partner, at which point they kind of took the reins and identified this and have, have put out some national bulletins to law enforcement about this specific uh, substance that we located and identified here in Independence. Madam Mayor. Yes. Sergeant, so is that something that's a new street drug that's beginning to, to come out or, or new substance? That's best we can tell, it's, it's a concoction of, of what, what I would say would be normal street drugs or street drugs that are out there uh, and have been around for a long time, but they've fused them together to put a little bit of a twist on it and they're, they're basically rebranding it and calling it uh, something different. Uh, probably just just for marketing sake, uh, more than anything. Interesting. Okay. So this is a picture of some of the stolen property that we recovered from what we refer to as as the the red dot burglary case. So this was um, storage units that were being burglarized repeatedly and created a, a significant amount of victims in our city. Um, during the course of our investigation, once we were inserted, we did identify a subject, we did track that subject, and ultimately were able to make an arrest in that and cleared almost 50 burglaries. At this point, we have brought uh, almost 20 state charges against that subject, and we have several other, other that are pending. To give you an idea, this room that this property is stored in, this room was completely vacant. There's nothing in this room. And if this was a pan shot and you plan, panned all the way to the left of that door, as you see the photo, there's equal amount of property on that side uh, as well as this. And this is photo was taken after property was released to 17 victims of that of that case. It is not in the police department building. It is stored uh, in an offsite location owned by the city. Mainly, we, we didn't have a, a room, quite honestly, big enough mm -hmm. to house that much stolen property. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much all I have, a quick update on some of the stats and some of the cases that we've been involved in working. Fantastic job. Thank you. Comments or questions? Uh, this is like a drop of ink in a clear water. I mean, you've had this phenomenal success, which we thought would be now comes the grunt work, the court times, the storage, the rehabilitation, the paperwork that you have to go through. Uh, the more success you have, the more work you're going to have. <laughs> but we supported this, and we will support you on this, too. Excellent. Thank you. And, you know, it's kind of a unique opportunity. Um, we are the action piece of the big puzzle, so I don't want to take credit um, that this was all a street crimes endeavor. The street crimes were kind of the, the action or the enforcement arm in a lot of this, whether it's working with intelligence, working with criminal investigations, working with patrol, we're taking all that information that kind of would stall out oftentimes and, and we are doing something immediate with it. And in turn, some of these cases we are seeing all the way to the end. Some of them we are turning back over to the investigators uh, in some of these other areas so they can go ahead and, and follow up on it and pr do these presentations which will help keep us in the field so we're, we're constantly, constantly moving toward achieving these kinds of goals. Anything else? Yes. yes. Uh, Sergeant, so walk me through <coughs> how do you really find the three areas or what criteria do you look at that focuses you know, on one side as opposed to another? I'm a snap off, if I'm a ticket thief sitting there looking, so how do you get the upper board? Okay. So th that's, there's a, a lot of different facets that get brought in when we decide what, what we're going to address. And eventually, we will address everything that we get handed to us. However, uh, our, our crime analysts um, do a phenomenal job, and we will take the, the, just the data that they are crunching, and then we'll go up on a, on a daily or multi, multi times a week, and they will give us information and say, hey, this is, this is a trend, or this is a person we're seeing repeated. This is a, a going to be an issue. 
we also are very engaged out in the community and that's probably if, if i was to say one of our, our biggest things is we will talk to any and everyone whether it's a suspect or whether it's somebody in line at quick trip or whether it's a business owner we go in for some reason we will talk to everyone and we are we're asking them hey what's going on do you have a problem in your neighborhood do you have a, a problem person do you have a problem house and and just really actively engaging the community has been something that we have got a lot of information that has kind of driven some of our investigations quite honestly um, so the human intelligence part is is huge as well as the police reports you know the the high spikes um, you know in, in the crime areas and that's really driving uh, what we're doing as well so we will take that 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 information and we are not sitting on any on it any of it we are acting pretty much immediately we get a tip at quick trip uh, if we're not engaged in something else at that moment we'll rally up a couple guys and we'll go address that problem that afternoon and that's really kind of helping uh, with these results This is something I wish we would have done 10 years ago, but we didn't, so here we are. So we're playing catch up, and I know you guys have a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of interest out there, but, but this is something that we can definitely talk about, that we have this unit that can be very specific if need to be in, in areas to, to help resolve different issues and, and problems. So I guess in the future, we, maybe we should have another another unit some somehow, some way. But you guys are doing great, so I appreciate your your guys' hard work and, and everything you, you men and women do over there. It's, it's definitely a, a challenge, and we've got some big hurdles to go over, but we're moving in the right direction. So thank you. anything we can do to help with that, let us know, please. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Sergeant. Okay. Um, our last presentation, thanks, Major, um, is on business licensing <coughs> overview. Mr. St. Manza. Yes, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, Yet another success to highlight tonight has been our work in our community development department where we have consolidated a number of fragmented functions into uh, our regulated industries division. Um, so tonight we are asking our assistant director of community development, Diane Egger, who oversees that regulated industries division to really focus on um, uh, one of the many aspects of under her purview and that is business licensing where we've seen a number of improvements and efficiencies and so Diane's going to highlight that for you and, and really share some of the successes we've had so I will turn over to Diane good evening mayor Hello. council members my name is Diane Egger I'm the assistant director for community development it's hard to follow up on the place with all the stolen goods and stuff but I'll do my best <laughs> um, so I've been over uh, the business license division over here at community development for a couple of months and we've made a lot of um, not just me of my staff over here just awesome people but we've made a lot of um, progress, we've done some things in the past, we've done some uh, pro processes and procedures that we're changing and working on and some a few things that we're working on in the future, the short-term future. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly give you a presentation this evening um, and go over some of those. Um, most people know, but some people don't. Um, all businesses that uh, operate in the City of Independence have to have a business license. Whether you're making money in City of Independence, whether you're local, whether you're out of state, you must obtain a business license. Um, the business license compliance officers, we have four. Um, we've hired an additional one, um, but we have four. They're sitting over here. Great people, awesome, on their own time, came to support me. <laughs> Yay! Roman Davis, Rachel Ice, Perry Hill, Angela Miller. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yay! <laughs> They're just a great group of people. I mean, I really can't say enough about just how wonderful they are. Um, some, some of the business license functions that we oversee, some of the umbrella, what I call the umbrella uh, portions of business license are just the actual business license itself, liquor licensing, um, landlord licensing, the rental ready program, um, and the landlord tenant complaints, which is something new um, that we've picked up from property maintenance. We've moved it over to um, the business license division. And we also oversee all these different kinds of businesses, retail stores, hotels, restaurants, I just didn't know when I started, you know, carnivals and metal recyclers, all these different businesses that we oversee have to have a business license. Um, and so we make sure that they come into compliance and if they have questions that they can uh, come and ask us. License numbers, we have over 9,000 businesses in independence and we've run the numbers as well. Over around 10% of them are delinquent or out of compliance with their business license. So we have 
roughly 10% of businesses out there that are operating illegally. So what do we do to change that? Well, there's a little slide down here. I'll talk about that briefly. Um, some of the changes that we've made in the past, looking just to briefly to the past and I'll go to the future, we have um, some of the changes. The business application process, we've looked at that and streamlined it. So when someone would come in and fill out a business license application, um, it had some um, additional wording, some duplication of, of uh, questions that were asked, and so we've streamlined that to make it easier for people. And they just have fewer questions when they come in, it's easier to fill out. So well, that was really um, awesome. Sounds simple also, a voicemail update. Sounds like a very simple thing, which it is, um, but we've made it more automated. And so where we used to have almost everyone would call in to business license, you'd immediately need to talk to a person. What we've done is they've changed it to where it'll, you know, this is where we are, this is what you'll do if you have questions, mm -hmm. you know, then push one or whatever it is. And mm -hmm. so then it, to finally get a person, but that cut down our call volume by 80%, wow. which is a lot. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these people call um, and they have a simple question and they can get those answered. So just to, you know, help staff, just to make it streamline it, make it more efficient, that's what, that's what we've done. We've also looked at uh, the business license renewal forms. The old way of uh, renewing a business license form is we'd send out 30 days prior to an expiration date of a business license, we'd send out, hey, you have 30 days, your business license is gonna expire. Say it's expired, after that we would send out multiple notices, hey, hello, your business is <laughs> expired, <laughs> and then another one, hey, guess what, it's still expired. Um, and so we've just cut that off, save money on paper, we spend a lot of money on paper, um, and so we're trying to make it a, a greener and more efficient, we're sending one notice. 30 days prior to your business license expiring, hey, come and get your business license. Um, and if they don't, that's what we're gonna talk about in just another slide, but um, so that was that's something that has been changed. We're also scanning a lot of old paperwork, a lot of old documents. Again, just something really simple, but it helps streamline the process. It helps that we've uh, scanned it, put it into CityWorks so that multiple people can see it. Rather than some paper sticking it, you know, in a file cabinet behind somebody's desk, if somebody even from another apartment has access to CityWorks and they wanna look something up, then they can look something up. It's just more transparency for the city. And less paperwork. So looking forward, we're looking forward to a couple of big Kind of big items, um, we're looking at combining a business license as a today, if a contractor, city contractor comes out or any contractor to work in the city, they have to fill out both a business license and a contractor's license. So what we're going to do, um, staff has done a really great job of contacting other jurisdictions to see on different things that we do, how they do it differently than what we do. Um, and what we found is that a lot of jurisdictions around us combine those into one license. So what doesn't necessarily change the fee at all, but it's, uh, it's just streams line when they come in, hey, here's the one window you go to, rather than go to this window and then come over here to get this as well, rather than getting two licenses, they get one. And also with the, uh, the nearly 10% of the non-compliant business licenses that we have out there, we're getting set April 1st, which is just next week, to start the enforcement of a business license program. So what we're going to do, we've hired, we've gotten equipment for staff, we have the great staff, staff they're being trained, um, ready to hit the, hit the road, and on April 1st, um, they're going to start running reports on who is delinquent on a business license, and then we're gonna go out and visit those businesses and make sure that they come into compliance. So how are we gonna do that? Well, this is how, on April 1st, so this is the, what we'll work under, the city code that we'll work under, Everybody has to get a business license if you're doing business um, engaging in activity it's in the city. And this is how we're gonna do it. So we're going to run a report of the delinquent businesses, all not all through the past, but for the previous month. Whoever came delinquent the previous month, we're gonna go out that following month. We have a letter written up. We're going to print it off, hand deliver it to the business, talk to them, talk to the owner, talk to the business, and tell them you have 48 hours to come in and get your business license. And if they don't, then we will go and post the property. So that should bring them in. That should bring in. That should do it, John. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> questions, I'm, I'm feeling questions here, everyone. <laughs> but that's what we're gonna do. And you know, I found that when I was over, you know, with the, the food inspections, if we did that, if we went and talked to people, sometimes they just don't know. Yeah. They don't have to get the mail, they're unaware. You know, you know, most oftentimes it's a $75 fee. They're just not aware of what's 
transpiring, and there's also extenuating circumstances for things. So we'll work with people, yeah. but for the most part, that's what we're going to do. This is your business license. You have to have it. If everyone else has to have it, so do you. Yeah. Madam Mayor. Yes. Diane, so yes. what does that mean when you say post? That means... Oh, so that would, we would give them 48 hours. So, you know, the plan is, you know, we have this all worked out by days, sure. but you have to have, give them, you know, you don't want to go out necessarily on a Friday that we could. Um, not as, you know, user-friendly for the, <laughs> the beginning to go, the, the run out here. Um, but when we go post the property, it will be closed. It will be a closure notice. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. and we would go out in the morning. Mm -hmm. They would have to run up. They could come up anytime, eight to five, get a business okay. license. They're they're good to go. Can they do it online? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they don't. Yeah, even they don't have to, have to physically I mean, they can come. come up. They can do That's it in right. the middle of the night if they want. That's to. That's exactly right. Okay. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Well, that's good. It, I'm glad you're getting out there. I heard you got some new vehicles to get out there and not have to be towed back. That's exactly right. We do have nice, <laughs> quiet electric the vehicles. Did we the hole in the side of it, or we still got that one? <laughs> 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 the one with the square tires? No, we got rid of that yeah, one, Mayor. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right, just checking. <laughs> no, we have all nice yeah. electric vehicles. And, uh, yeah, so the staff has all the equipment. They have the vehicles, the badges, the ticket books. They're ready to roll. Okay. And one, one other little follow-up thing. I got a complaint from a, a constituent, an older retired person. They, they called, uh, I won't call the name out because I have nothing against Rotor Rooter. So they called this company out there and they gave the lady an estimate. They came up to City Hall and got a permit for a tremendously, tremendously lower amount than they actually charged the customer. Mm -hmm. So is there maybe some way we could think of to maybe verify what they're they're getting the permit for which is the minimum fee but yet they're charging the customer a different fee and we're losing the difference in fees i don't mm -hmm. know i don't know how you do it but just make i don't know but there's got to be something that we can do but yeah. th the uh, difference was the difference between a two thousand dollar bill and a nine thousand dollar bill and the permit yeah. was taken on the two thousand mm -hmm. dollars and i got a complaint from an elderly person they didn't feel that was a fair price which that's really not our issue, but in further in checking into it, that's how they shortchanged, I'm sorry, they, they feel they may have shortchanged the customer in the work, they shortchanged the city in the fees. Yeah, we will definitely look into that. Thanks. Well, there are all ways to figure that out. Councilman? Uh, I see here 9,000, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yes. And a third of that is rentals, 3,000 rentals that we, uh, uh, business license and uh, which we've uh, what tripled since the program began Perry on the rental we, we've increased that by 1,000 right. the actual rental units though um, yeah. yeah units the the licensing we've it, we've increased by a thousand a thousand from two yeah. okay I so we have three thousand total three thousand one hundred still county no it's a lot yeah we have a yeah, lot. yeah and still coming in but the rental units um, that before the rental ready program we had 2,900 roughly and now we have 19,000 on the book so we've yeah we're starting to yeah really yeah. get a handle on that so so now we want to make sure we get the business yeah. licenses I'm not saying it's the, the best business. ever <laughs> yeah <laughs> second best <laughs> um, just back to the um, enforcement and the compliance and all of that I mean yeah I mean it seems much more uh, efficient to send them a notice and then if they, you don't get it from them, pay them a visit and make sure that it gets um, handled. I mean, time and time again, whether it's property code violation, I mean, the, the, the sweeps that we did on 24 Highway, 40 Highway, Truman Road, we've got a tremendous rental ready is another example really a really high voluntary compliance rate mm -hmm. once people um, understand that, you know, they dig it out from the bottom of the pile or whatever yeah. and get to it. So I think that's a really great approach, which I know is somewhat labor intensive for your staff to do that. Um, but um, I think in the long run, it's gonna be much more efficient and much more in line with our customer service uh, goals for the city is to have that uh, personal touch and I think you know maybe you know one friendly visit um, is a lot more effective than four or five reminders in the mail if they didn't get the first one they're not getting the second one they're not getting the third one right. so yeah um, 
thanks for implementing that. And you know, I know all of your people on your staff, and they're great representatives of the city to go out and have those conversations. Um, so although it sounds maybe kind of punitive, I really don't think that it is. I think it's a much you know, better way to deal with our citizens and our past success has, our, you know, has really shown that those one-on-one -on -one going out and visiting with people um, really brings with people. They want to be in compliance. I yes, mean, most, most them, people do. They, they yes, want, they do. They, they truly do. They want to do what's right. They just, yeah. you know, for whatever reason. They might need a friendly it. reminder. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, anything else? Madam Mayor, yes. I mean, just, just to tap into this just a little bit. When you first got up there, you said you thought it would be hard to beat, but you're working perfectly into a good segue there because we're doing things different with our police department, with our street crimes unit. We're trying to get aggressive here with, with people with business license. And I, I do believe, Mayor, that a lot of people have a good heart and they just forgot through the mail. But there's also, there's been a long time decade yep. of where nobody's ever followed up, done the work and go knock on the door. And that's the, that's the difference there, that we're willing to do that. And I think that's going to start, um, I don't want to say shake people up, but know that we're serious about stuff now. So yes. it's, your presentation is this perfect um, segue that we had there with, with the police, because we're trying to do things different. It just takes a little bit of time just to kind of get that corner and get moving. So And I think after a that. couple of months and people hear about it, sure. maybe we have some closures, then maybe people will come into compliance on their own. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, great. Um, yeah, I would be really interested in, you know, sometime in the next six months or so, kind of a little bit of an update on how that's going. I mean, I expect tremendous results from that approach of uh, voluntary compliance, which is, you know, in turn revenue to the city, but also I think creates a more business friendly atmosphere when people know what the expectations are and that they're going to be held accountable to right. those expectations. And everyone to the same standard. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Diane. Thank you. Okay. Uh, lastly, this evening, we have City Boards and Commissions report. Uh, Madam City Clerk. Yes, Mayor, members of the Council. In front of you have our City Boards and Commissions report. We have three items to discuss. First on the list is the Independence Advice. Advisory Board of Health. There has been a recommendation to appoint Shauna Jackson as a lay member of the board. So I'm seeking direction to add a resolution to the next meeting. Um, if there's no objection from the council, we will forward Shauna Jackson to the next um, regular council meeting for a resolution for the next council meeting. Okay, hearing none. All right, Christy. next we have the Japanese Sister City Committee. Uh, we had a recommendation to reappoint Chrissy DeMeyer and appoint Max Land, Dustin Heinrich, and Hannah Newberry to the committee. So I'm seeking direction to add a resolution for those persons. Okay, again, if there's no objection from the council, we will have the city clerk prepare a resolution for the next council meeting. Okay, hearing none. And lastly, we have the Tourism Commission. There's a recommendation has been received to appoint President Russell Cannon as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints representative to the commission, seeking direction to add a resolution. If there's no objection from the council, I'll have the city clerk prepare a resolution for the next council meeting. Okay, hearing none. Um, are there any other topics any council member wishes to discuss this evening? Mr. City Manager, anything? Nothing else, thank you. We're adjourned.